Hey guys, welcome to episode 22 of the Pageant Boss podcast. Now, the title of this episode is wrapping up the pageant, uh, the pageant bass, the pageant boss. I'm not stopping what I'm doing. What I've decided to do is actually roll this podcast into the main pageant project podcast, mainly just making it a little bit easier for me to manage, but also making it easier for the people who may not have seen, as crazy as it sounds for you guys listening to this, there are still a lot of people who don't know that I've started this as a separate podcast. There's a lot of people who watch the Instagram reels, the little clips I put up, but there's a lot of people who have yet to tune into the actual main podcast. So I want to make it a bit easier for them to find it. So I'm going to roll the pageant boss into the main podcast, but I'll make it very clear which episodes are the pageant boss and which episodes, for example, are the interviews that I have done and will continue to do and which episodes are the uh, pageants and PJs podcast. Um, you'll, you'll see that when I do it. It's super, super clear. So that is an episode title. Um, and just to take you back round about 30 days, it's a bit more than that now, I started the Pageant Boss podcast uh, basically because of Emma Collingridge's hashtag I promise 30 days campaign. And that really clicked with me, the idea specifically of doing something small consistently um, in terms of the power that has to change your life, much more so than making one grandiose promise and trying to desperately live up to it somehow for 30 days and then realizing that was impossible and at the end of 30 days having really not actually achieved anything. Um, and what I'm going to do today, uh, I just want to shout out to Emma because, you know, she she was the impetus for starting this and she knows that. Um, what I wanted to do today before I sort of wrap up the separate Pageant Boss podcast and before I roll it into the main podcast is to go over three lessons that I've learned in the past, let's call it 30 days, give or take. I mean, this is episode, what, 22? Um, and I guess going on that, the uh, the very first lesson, and pardon me, I'm just, if you're looking at the video, I'm looking down because I did jot it down, which is unusual for me. I normally just riff, but I wanted to keep it to three lessons. But the whole fact that this is episode 22 after 30 days, when I said I was going to publish a podcast episode every day, that leads in to point number one, which is done is better than perfect. So point one, done is better than perfect. And look, at the beginning of 30 days, I actually started two podcasts. Uh, one was the other one being The Rat Race is Dead. So I started 30 days with two podcasts. Well, three, I guess The Rat Race is Dead. This one, The Pageant Boss. And then obviously the third one, which is the main pageant project podcast. And basically, I'm going to end up after 30 days with only one. Or I'm just going to go back to the main pageant project podcast. And you could look at that as a failure. And certainly in some ways, it's like, well, I didn't hit my target. I certainly didn't hit my target of recording a podcast episode every day for the Rat Race is Dead and the pageant boss. So I was going to the target was 60 and I hit maybe half of that, 30, um, between the pageant boss and the rat race is dead. And you could look at that. And certainly in the past, I would have looked at that and gone, well, I aimed for 60, I only got 30. That's a fail. But life is not about fail or succeed. Life, I believe, is about progress. And if you measure the last 30 days of your life, and let's say the main three areas, which I talk about all the time, health, wealth, and relationships, and you were to ask yourself, what's the progress you've made in those three areas? I think progress is a much better thing to focus on than fail or success or simply done or not. For example, when it comes to transforming your body, I think it's much better to to focus on, you know, maybe I could only run for 20 minutes at the beginning of 30 days. Now I can run for half an hour. And that's progress. And that'll make you feel good. And that makes you much more likely to continue going Whereas if you've made your, your focus, oh, I needed to have got, got from 20% body fat to 10% body fat. And let's say in those 30 days, you really did your workouts, you really ate healthily. But you know, you never really know how your body's going to respond. Everyone's different. And you only dropped from 20 to 18, in inverted commas only. Or God forbid, you actually went up in body fat for some reason, because that can happen. Sometimes it's just down to measurement error. Or the main, the big danger is you got down to, let's say, 15, which is amazing in a month. 
but someone else got down to 12 and now you're looking at it as a loss. This is why I say looking at progress, progress is better than perfection. And I really believe that. But also to really run your own race. Do not look at what other people are doing. And I've got to be honest, over the last sort of the last 10 days, at least, I would say of the 30 day, I prom Emma's, um, I promise 30 days challenge. I've really, I wouldn't even say disciplined myself not to look so much at other people's social media. I have felt, I have felt less wanting to, because I realized quite quickly that as soon as I looked at least at certain other people's social media, or at least I started that whole scrolling thing, you know, when you're just doing nothing and you're just scrolling and your thumbs are getting the workout, that never led me to a better place mentally and emotionally. So I, I pretty much have stopped doing that, which I think is a good thing. But as I said, point one, the lesson that I've learned over the last 30 days is that done is better than perfect. And with a podcast specifically, it's led to so many opportunities. It's led to paid coaching opportunities for myself. I've had a lot of great feedback from some of you guys. Thank you for that. Privately or publicly with comments and things like that. And I appreciate all of it. Um, because you've taken, out, taken the time out of your day to say something to me, which I, I don't take for granted. And then thirdly, I think it's it's confirmed for me that people actually do want to listen. Some people anyway want to listen to what I have to say, even though, look, I, I have a lot of experience coaching and I think I'm a very good coach. But, you know, as a pageant coach, very, very new to the space. So I was never completely sure that anyone would want to have would want to listen to what I had to say in the pageant space um, and certainly I wasn't sure if anyone was, would be willing to pay for coaching and in the last 30 days I found that both of those limiting beliefs that I had were exactly that limiting beliefs because they certainly weren't true um, I wasn't aiming to be the biggest pageant coach in the world or the best I just wanted to put my voice out there and see what happened and um, and again, that's why I think the I Promise 30 Days Challenge is such a good way of doing that because you just focus on doing something small every day. You're not trying to transform the world every day, which is what a lot of people do when they make their goals. They wanted to make it hugely inspiring or hugely transformative. And, you know, I think it's better just to focus on the little action every day. So that was lesson one for me, done better than perfect. Uh, number two, mindset is the most underused underrated and misunderstood weapon in your pageantry toolkit. Mindset is the most underused, underrated and misunderstood weapon in your pageantry toolkit. Now, why do I say that? And by the way, these three lessons, you're going to go, I know this. It's like, yeah, you can know it, but are you actually doing it? If you don't do it, you don't know it. I say mindset is the most misunderstood or underused or underrated part of pageantry is because out of everyone that has had paid coaching with me, and even the people who I've just had conversations with and maybe not had a full-on session with, it has always boiled down at some point to mindset. Um, and I, I remember even the first, the first or second girl that I coached, who was a very, who is a very well-known queen in the UK. And from the outside, you would never think that she would have any issues with confidence or self-belief because she has ama an amazing title. And she was really, really struggling with mindset. And when you book in for a coaching session with me, one of the questions I have on the intake form is, what is your biggest challenge? In fact, to enter the Pageant Boss Facebook group, one of those questions is, what is currently your biggest challenge? And you kind of know it's a mindset issue when the answer to it is so self-evident, yet it's so challenging at the same time. So for example, I'm coaching someone tomorrow and she said her biggest challenge is a lack of self-belief. Now, I'm sure you can resonate with that. I certainly can resonate with that. As I just told you, I had a limiting belief that no one would listen, would want to listen to what I had to say in the pageantry space and no one would hire me as a pageant coach. Um, but when you think of something like my challenge is a, a lack of self-belief, well, the solution is self-evident. The solution is believe in yourself. And normally, by the way, 
not to be too facetious about it, normally there's a lot of good reasons to believe in yourself because the people who are getting me in for coaching are high achievers. They're not complete newbies. They're not unknown quantities. And some of them are really, really like A-level high achievers. And you just think, well, if your challenge is self-belief, firstly, stop doing that. Secondly, believe in yourself. And thirdly, here are all the reasons why you should believe in yourself. You've won this title. You've done this many photo shoots. Everyone thinks you're amazing. Everyone thinks you're gorgeous. Everyone thinks you're intelligent, etc. Like I could list 10 reasons off the top of my head that this person should believe in themselves. And by the way, they're all true, not blowing smoke, right? Not making stuff up. And then you just realize doesn't matter what I tell you or anyone else tells you. The only thing that really matters is what you fundamentally believe about yourself. And that, in terms of mindset, that has come up again and again and again. Different people have different labels for it, to be sure. A lot of people use the term imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is, again, it's a lack of belief. You don't believe you deserve where you are so you believe you're going to be found out, right? Or a lack of confidence, let's say, in interview. And a lot of time that stems from, oh, I need to say the right thing. Well, there is no right thing. Frankly, you're in front of a set of judges and on one day they may love you and the other day they may hate you. There is certainly a bit of hidden miss to that. So again, it's this lack of belief or it's a limiting belief that you need to say the right thing when there is no such right thing that is holding you, holding you back. Or... I had another um, session with a client who she wasn't posting nearly as much as she knew she should because she wanted every post to be perfect. And she would spend hours on each post to the point where sometimes she would spend hours on a post and then still not post it. And I had to say to her, look, I put out, let's say, 10 posts on my social media platforms, various ones, let's say in roughly a day, you're putting up one or two posts every three days. So you put up like one or two a week. I'm putting up like by the end of a week across all my platforms, probably 30 pieces of content. And I'm not saying mine are better than yours, but you just got to say like, we don't know which one is perfect, which post is perfect. We don't know which one that people are going to resonate with most because a lot of it is hit and miss. You obviously do the best you can with each piece of content, but you never know which one like is going to really resonate. So who do you think has a better chance of really cutting through with their message. Me putting out 30 pieces of content a week or you putting out one or two. And, you know, she would laugh about it and she knew I was sort of pulling her leg. But at the end of the day, it's really true. But what I want to get across to you is that her problem was not that she can't post more. Her problem was that it's a, it's a mindset issue that she thought she needed to be perfect or that each post needed to change the world. It's just a social media post right? Just put it out. So number two, mindset has certainly been the most underused, underrated, and misunderstood weapon in your pageantry toolkit. And I say weapon is because if you learn how to harness it effectively, it can become by far your biggest weapon, your biggest asset. I'm not saying use it as a weapon. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying play mind games. I think that's a load of BS. Do not do that. Mind you, if you're confident, go for it, right? Some people go, oh, she's so confident, she's trying to play mind games. No, no, sometimes when um, people who have low self-esteem see confident people, they misunderstand it and that's their issue. But um, you do want to make your mindset, I believe, your biggest asset and your biggest strength. And that's something that everyone can do. Not everyone can be six foot tall, right? Not everyone can have certain physique, right? You can't suddenly have bigger, I was going to say you can't have bigger breasts, but I mean, plastic surgery says you can, or bigger hips or smaller hips, right? There are certain parts of our body, our anatomy that we're born with. It's genetics and we can't change that, but we can all master our mindset or become victims of it. Really, the choice is ours. So number lesson, number lesson one, number one lesson was done is better than perfect. Number two was about mindset. And number three, and this is probably the, the strangest one, you all know what to do. You just need to do what you know, right? Lesson number three, you all know what to do. You just need to do what you know. Um, And I say this because out of all the lessons I've given, all the podcast episodes I've done, I've not told you anything. I might have given you a great idea somewhere, 
but I've not told you anything and you've gone, wow, um, that is so out there that I'm not going to say you never would have thought of it, but I think when, anything I give you, it's been like, yeah, that makes sense, right? It's not like I'm giving you some fact about, I don't know, quantum mechanics and you went, gee, I've never heard of that and I don't understand it. That's completely new knowledge to me. Like when I tell you that done is better than perfect, for example, you know that, but are you doing it? Again, like if you're not doing it, you don't know it. So every piece of advice I've given to someone, whether it's mindset or whether it's something else like their social media or their advocacy, I may have given you a bright idea here or there. And that's just from a different perspective, different point of view. I'm not saying I'm so bright or smart. What I want to get across to you is if I ask you, right? And I, I've mentioned this in a previous podcast. I said, if you got out of yourself and out of your own story, because sometimes we become so attached to our own story that we can't see the solutions to our problems, but we're really good at seeing the solutions to other people's problems, right? And we're all like that, I think, at least to some level. If I got you to get out of yourself or said your best friend had the same issues that you did, but it's not you, it's your best friend, what advice would you give her or give him? And, you know, it might take a moment of thought, but almost always the person, the client that I'm coaching has an answer and it's a great answer. And because it's their answer, they're more likely to do it because there's no like one right answer, right? There's different solutions for different people. But hey, if you came up with a solution yourself, then it's going to be one that will probably work for you. So it's not about me telling you something you didn't know. It's about me getting you, helping to get you out of your own way so that you do what you already know. And I'm just having deja vu because I've said this exact same phrase to the to the phone probably two weeks ago, right? Um, and the only thing I will give you on this, so you go, well, great, Adrian, thank you. If I already know what to do and the only challenge is doing what I know, well, how do I make sure that I do that more often, right? And this is where I've already, I have a very dim view on motivation because motivation doesn't last. I don't think you can rely on it, right? We all have bad days and you want to be able to persevere through and get the job done even when you're not feeling your best. So motivation out the window and you go, well, that's discipline because motivation is doing it when you want to and discipline is doing it when you don't want to. And I thought that was it. So it's like, oh, I got to be disciplined. But you know this, like discipline never lasts either, at least for 99% of us population. Like we can stick to a goal for so long, but if it's you know grinding, 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 and it's unpleasant, which is how I feel about the word discipline, it doesn't feel like a pleasant word. It feels like I'm doing it even though I don't want to do it. I'm fighting, 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 fighting. I think that can only last so long because us humans are not wired to do something that's uncomfortable, just biologically speaking. I think the people who have amazing discipline actually at some part enjoy the grind. So for them, in some way, it's not actually discipline because they're getting enjoyment out of it. For me, discipline is kind of like a dirty word. Now, if that's you and your discipline has failed you in the past. And I was listening to a multi-billionaire salesperson say this, and he's more disciplined than most, as he said. But he said, even I don't rely on my discipline because I know it's not going to work. He said, and there's different ways of approaching this. He said, for example, if your goal is to get up at 5 a.m. and go for a jog, he said he wouldn't do that. He said he'd fail. So he doesn't rely on his motivation. He doesn't rely on his discipline. What does he do? He invites two or three of his friends who also want to run at 5 in the morning, and they're going to come to his house, and they're going to go for a run together at 5 in the morning. Now, why would that work? Well, he said it's because at 5 a.m., knock, 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 knock. He's got his friends out there with their shoes on ready to run. I mean, what is he going to do? Not wake up and just let them go away? Not like, no, that's not going to happen, right? So that's not discipline. That's not motivation. What I would say that is, is leverage. And leverage is this concept where you get yourself to a point where you know you're going to follow through no matter what. I mean, there's literally no choice. Now, if I was to give you one thing with this whole it's not about what... You, so remember, I said, you all know what to do. You just need to do what you know. The one way to get yourself to do that, no matter what, 
is to get leverage on yourself. Now, this person who by his, by the way, his name is Dan Locke. He said, you know, gave you that example of how he would get leverage on himself to go for a jog. Another way people often do it in terms of at least physical health is getting a personal trainer, not a gym membership, a personal trainer. In fact, I don't know exactly what the statistics are about how many people get gym memberships and never use them, but you'd be amazed at how staggeringly high it is. Like literally, it's mind boggling. You have the most amazing gym, all the equipment in the world. It's an amazing venue and you never use it. Why does a personal trainer work better? People go, oh, because it costs a lot. Eh, not every personal trainer costs a lot. What it is, is there's someone there at, let's say, 5 a.m. or 7 a.m. or whenever it is going, where the hell are you if you haven't turned up? Now, that's leverage. Because for most of us, if we hire a personal trainer at a certain moment, unless, let's say, we're sick or we're unavoidably delayed at work, we're going to make that session, Right? because there's someone else there who's relying on us or depending on us. So that's how you get leverage on yourself. It's normally by getting other people involved and engaged in your progress or your goal, whatever it is. Now, if it's something that's, let's say, not as obvious or not as at least often spoken of as your physical health, let's say you wanted to do... Um, Let's say you wanted to brainstorm 10 ways or 10 business ideas every day and you're wondering how do I get leverage to do that as a crazy example. One way you can do this, even if you have no one around you who you would trust to give, give um, who you would trust to get leverage over you, this is you can do on social media. This is where campaigns, and this is why, again, I loved Emma's campaign so much because what you do is you promise what you're going, like a little action that you can do every day for 30 days, you declare it publicly on social media. So you're getting that leverage on yourself. And then you just post a little story or a little post each day showing people that you've done it. And it's not really about them. It is still about you, but you've gotten leverage on yourself because you've publicly declared it. You've got that pressure on yourself and it works. And the reason I know it works is because when you tell someone this is an easy way to get leverage on yourself, and you think everyone would do it. Do you know the number of people who say, oh, I can't do that. That's uncomfortable. Well, it's not uncomfortable because it wouldn't work. It's actually uncomfortable because you know it would work. You know there's no backing out. And sometimes the goal that we say we want actually has consequences of consequences, like success consequences that you don't want so you end up self-sabotaging. I would actually say your brain is protecting you, but you take two steps forward and two steps back. It's like, I want to start this business and be really successful. Oh, but I don't want to be judged, right? Oh, I want to start a new relationship. Oh, I never want to be rejected. And you're going back and forth, back and forth, like, you know, like a seesaw or you're on a ship and you're going to be seasick because you're going back, forth, back and forth. That's what happens when you don't get leverage on yourself. You go for a goal but you know there are going to be some consequences that you don't really want, so then you self-sabotage. A really classic one is, oh, I really want to get into shape, but I don't want to get up early, right? Now, why would you say that? Well, because it's, again, our brain is wired for comfort. It's not wired for discomfort. Otherwise, you go around touching burning stoves all the time. And guess it's not comfortable to get up at five in the morning when it's cold out. I should know. So our brains are not wired to do things that we find uncomfortable on an ongoing basis, because otherwise that's not a good survival mechanism. But the way, again, you, that you can circumvent it is by getting leverage on yourself. So be very careful. When you set yourself a goal and you say you really want it, are there perhaps success consequences that are holding you back? For example, one that I've dealt with, and it sounds so stupid, it's like, oh, I really want to have a lot of money, or let's say a successful business, not for the money side of things, but to have an impact on the world, right? It's easier to have an impact when you have a lot of finances behind you, financial power. And then you go, well, why on earth wouldn't you go for that? Well, because in my mind, I wired it that if I have, let's say, a massive business, it's going to mean that I'll have no freedom to do what I want. 
I felt that I was going to have to be chained to a desk somewhere or chained in one place. And every day I was going to have to be putting out fires or dealing with terrible staff members or terrible customers or clients. And so I was sabotaging myself trying to pursue this goal that actually I kind of didn't want, to be honest. And when I dug into it, I realized what I wanted was not this massive company that a lot of other people said they did. What I wanted was actually something smaller, but a lot more flexible. I wanted something that would allow me to continue to travel around the world, work from where, where I wanted, not a Fortune 500 company where I'd have to be chained to the desk because you're the CEO. I mean, you can't just pack up and leave when you're running a huge company. So I hope, I hope that makes sense, right? In, in terms of, as I said, so that this is the third one. You all know what to do. You just need to do what you know. And the only way of doing that really is forget the motivation, forget discipline. You've got to get the leverage on yourself. And if that's uncomfortable, you want to dig into that and ask yourself, why is it uncomfortable? If leverage would guarantee your success, why are you backing away from it? That's a really interesting question to ask yourself. Okay, so let's leave it there. Let me recap. So lessons that I've learned over the last 30 days with the um, pageant podcast, pageant boss podcast. Number one, done is better than perfect. Number two, mindset is the most underused, underrated and misunderstood weapon in your pageantry toolkit. And number three, you all know what to do. You just need to do what you know. And the way to do that is to get leverage on yourself. So I hope that helps. That's been my lessons from the last 30 days. And again, look, it's not groundbreaking, right? These are all things that I think inherently each and every one of you would know. But again, if you don't do it, you don't really know it, right? You might intellectually know it, but getting it into your body and physically doing it is a different matter. So I hope that helps. A reminder that I'm going to move this into the main uh, pageant project podcast uh, just to make it a bit easier for everyone to find one thing in one location. Um, and that's about it. I'm going to wrap it up there. It's a Tuesday here. Sky doesn't know what it's doing. The weather here in Sydney is about is a bit chaotic at the moment. Um, but I hope the weather, wherever you're doing, wherever you are, is doing well. And I hope you're staying safe. Um, with this corona still lingering around, really hope it goes away soon. Thanks for watching or listening, and I'll see you in the next episode of the Pageant Boss podcast, which will be on the Pageant Project podcast. Speak to you then.